All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started. I'm your host, Terry Campbell. Thank you for joining the Prospect Heights Public Libraries program today. I want to remind everybody that today is part one of a three-part series, although you don't have to necessarily come to one to, to enjoy the others. Um, so if you're available the next two Mondays, please join us at one o'clock and our presenter will be um, adding to his three-part series. So today we want to welcome local resident Scott Sayward with us. Um, he is a big history buff and he has traveled to the South Pacific with his wife Janet uh, to follow in his father's footsteps um, through the World War II journey that his father took when he was uh, in service. So please welcome Scott Seward. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here today with all, you, all of you with the interest that you have and then also um, to be able to present these things to you because uh, you know history, what people do um, is important and it's, it's good that things are remembered. So uh, with that today, I can share with you some of the things that we did uh, to connect our, our own family history to the greater, larger historical areas and then also some fun travel stuff. So it looks like I need to, uh, my Zoom lock me out of here for a second. Sorry about that. There we go. So now we should be able to start. It also, I wanted to, um, I, I was supposed to have an overture of the South Pacific, which I, it, to me is like a most intriguing sound of uh, Rogers and Hammerstein ever did. So hopefully you can hear it in your, in your mind. But uh, it's so alluring and uh, it, it reminds me so much of uh, being a kid and them actually going to uh, the movie to see it. Um, before I get started, I just wanna do a few thank yous. And I wanna thank a few people like Janet, my wife, who's helped so much with the uh, things of that. Yeah. And then there's other people like the Pro uh, Prospect Heights Public Library and Terry Campbell. Um, I'm especially thankful to um, uh, John Moore, uh, presenter emeritus, uh, who's helped me with some things on the first time presentation. And also Bill Brode, who uh, actually probably connected a lot of these dots for us. So uh, they're sitting in the audience and we appreciate their, appreciate their attendance. Um, it started with, uh, so you're ready to go to the South Pacific and uh, I am too, uh, but I first wanted to tell you how it all started. And uh, it started uh, uh, with my father, that's 1941. Um, he was about 19, uh, he was, uh, I'm thinking now, he was uh, 19 and a half when Pearl Harbor hit. Can you speak louder? <clears throat> sure. Okay. Um, is that better? It is, otherwise I can turn the volume up, but uh, turn the volume up a little bit. Hey, we have to be careful with this because it gets loud real quick. Thing. How's that? Is that better? It's better? Okay, good. Um, so 41, he just graduated high school. He's from Park Ridge. Um, he's uh, dating my, my mother. She's 17 and a half and uh, she's from Displays and they're very much in love and then the war hits, right? So um, I, that's, that's a picture that he kept with her in the South Pacific where he was stationed. And uh, that's a picture of him there as well. Um, little did they know all the course of events that would happen, but he was inducted in uh, a year, about a year later after Pearl Harbor. And uh, then he was, he was 20 and a half. And uh, then she, I, naturally she was uh, 18 and a half, so she graduated. But um, what I wanted to say was he'd probably never gone any farther than Milwaukee. And she'd probably never gone any farther than Chicago. So after that induction, he's in for the, the ride of his life. Uh, so he ends up in the Army Corps of Engineers. That's a picture of them before they left. Uh, and, you know, just like every one of our fathers, uh, they, they weren't that interested in talking about their war experiences. He made this presentation case, which I brought. It shows his medals, uh, his campaign ribbons, how long he was going, some of the stripes and bars show his uh, service the stripe and also the, uh, how long he was overseas, his end rank of staff sergeant. Um, his original dog tags, which he had lost, 
And I ended up finding them when we were looking through the letters. So it was kind of an interesting thing. And they actually went with us to the South Pacific. And then um, his marksmanship medal. Um, they also kept scrapbooks. His was a, I guess, a swashbuckler or a pirate cover. And hers was a, a fair lady cover. So those were her, their, their documentary of all of what had happened. And then there were some other things that are important to him. That was his driver uh, license. And he could drive anything from a tank to a, a tractor to uh, uh, any type of vehicle. And uh, um, what's interesting there, it's not in this program, but there's a picture there of him by Catawaban. And I think I'm pronouncing that right in the Philippines. And his scout master uh, was in the uh, Bataan Death March. And he ended up going there and seeing his grave while he was there in 1944. Um, and then there's some other important telegrams he got from my mom and it's basically his ID card. But if you're interested to learn how to find a bit about their service, the uh, uh, separation paper, the DD-214 lists things that are uh, somewhat, this is somewhat uh, sketchy, but it was when he was being left, he left the service, so they didn't have everything in there, but it gives his rank, how long he was uh, in that rank, it gives uh, where he lived, when he was brought into the service, and when he was uh, uh, separated. And a brief description, he said he was in the service, uh, Philippines and Japan, uh, and he was responsible for uh, 40 vehicles. And it's, it's a it, nice little, little bits of information, but there's more to it. On the back page, it shows exactly what um, unit he was in. He was in the Army Corps of Engineers, like I said. Um, he had, ended up in Motor Pool, and uh, it indicates um, where, uh, what, what is, where his uh, theater of operations was. So that's what those ribbons meant. And then also um, uh, his, his final pay, which was, uh, I think, $172. And uh, he was issued a lapel pin. So that helps a little bit. Um, another big part of this was a, uh, one of his co uh, colleagues, Roman Click. Uh, he was in the uh, headquarters and supply, but he was basically the head of the office, you know, the, the administrative office. So Roman was a, a master at record keeping. And from Roman, he, much of the records were collected from their outfit because their outfit wasn't like the first army or where they have a definite history, or they kind of like bounced all around. So uh, Roman helped really make that happen to keep the records together. And um, um, with that, he and his son back in the 90s, his son was an, uh, a, a professor at uh, one of the junior colleges. He did a website for it. So we also have the website and the original one, we've updated it. So if you're interested in seeing more of it, it's the US, it's a long title, but hopefully you can remember it. <laughs> it's World War II, U.S. Army, Corps of Engineers, SouthPacific.org. And in that, there's uh, volumes of content, there's Roman's letters to his aunt that he wrote. I mean, there's just a lot of information along with their actual duties and things that they did. Uh, and those are all the different units that were involved in this uh, uh, engineering regiment. And... Uh, you know, it was hard to get him to talk. Uh, he'd write same things down sometimes. This was about the, the ship over for three weeks from San Francisco over to um, uh, New Caledonia. But then my, when my daughter got interested in the, documenting the history, um, she ended up um, interviewing him. And this was one of her sketch interviews that she first did. And we're going to concern ourselves with, um, uh, uh, well, we'll go briefly through it, but Camp Grand is where he took a train to, and he was there for a short time, and um, then Camp White out in Oregon for his basic training. They had additional training at uh, Camp Stoneman, and uh, after that, they went to New Caledonia, which is subject of the third one that we'll be presenting, but from there, um, they went uh, from New Caledonia to New Hebrides and he, he must have got some things mixed up because New Hebrides is not in the Solomons but um, that's really where we're going to start today is in Guadalcanal and uh, 
and actually it's called the Russell Islands. And, um, and then uh, the further that they went to New Guinea, the Philippines, they went to um, um, New Guinea, I said that, I know, they went to New Guinea, the Philippines, and then they went to Japan. And after <laughs> Japan, they came home. So he was overseas for almost three years. <clears throat> And there's some, he gives little bits and pieces of details uh, on each one of the trips. And the happiest time was on January 2nd of 46 when he's home. Um, from their official history, this is what helped fill it in. And you'll see how we tied in everything on our trip. This gives uh, the information from New Caledonia when they went to Benica, Russell's Island. So now, <laughs> we have a real name of an island that he went to because he'd always call it the Russells. Then they left Benica on a uh, LCI and on October 1st. So he was there about five months and they went out to Guadalcanal. They were there about another uh, six months and Guadalcanal, he went all over the place in New Georgia and Tulagi. And then they went to actually an island that was further back, Espiritu Santo. That'll be next week. Uh, so we'll leave that to next week, but at least you can see now we've got, I've got dates, right. To, to understand when he was, where he was. Um, this is the trip that he took. Um, if you, if you, I did calculations on it, it's not quite 24,000 miles on the sea. So if, uh, if you would, Travel around the equator, one full revolution, that's about 24,000 miles. So that's basically you know, what, what would have happened there over the period of the three years. My daughter was interested. She wanted to document some of it. So she decided to do her uh, honors thesis um, about it. And some of the things she had, she had written down things in a notebook. Unfortunately, in the process of that, she was um, of that interview he had a stroke and he passed on, it was about five weeks later. So that ended that. But um, there, they had, uh, and I'll show, it, yeah, I'll show it in a minute here. See the box, there's a box of letters there. Those are the box of letters he sent to his mother. And what my daughter did is and all those volumes on top, um, by date, those are all of his letters back home. So amazingly enough, you look at you know that one and a half inch volume, uh, December first through the eighteenth, it filled that entire three ring notebook. That's how many letters he sent back. And as you go, you know, farther and farther in time, he has less time to do that. He's on islands, so they become um, much much longer. Like from in 1944, July 4th of 44 to 1229, 44 is that yellow volume. So you can see how the war kind of changed things and you get so much more busier. Um, that was the box I found as dog tags in the bottom one. But she cataloged all this stuff and read every one of the letters. And then she uh, made this, uh, actually, well, here's my mom reading one of the letters. <laughs> um, but I, so I, let me flip back here. Um, so her vignette was done, but she left me with a really great prize. So when I could take those volumes and those dates that you saw on the islands, I could then place them to exactly where he was because most of those letters would have been scrubbed of any type of information about where they were. Otherwise, really uh, um, a wonderful thing that, that we're able to do. Once we knew where we could go, we tried to put together a little trip and uh, by ourselves to go to these islands and it was became like it was overwhelming, right? To, to go there. Some of them are private islands, so hard to even get on. Uh, and then well, Janet, what was it? There was still head hunting on some of the islands or something. So it wasn't something that was amenable to really want to try. So um, we were here listening to John Moore with the Sable Island uh, presentation and we wondered if John had gone there. So we asked John and he said, no, but a friend of mine in the front row was there. 
and that's Bill Brode. So Bill had been there twice on the land portion, portion of it. And um, he got us together with his tour company, which is Valor, which is out in, in Sausalito, California. And uh, they've been doing these tours for 40 years, maybe even more. And the, the original owner was an RAF pilot. Uh, so very, very deep into the knowledge of World War II, World War II history. And uh, they offered this amazing thing, this uh, cruise up the slot in the Solomon Islands, which we would never step on land until we got off back on the boat to leave. And it was basically our little PT boat because it was about the same size as the PT boat. And uh, we stayed in, there was 10 cabins, 20 people. And uh, we were able to basically go on about five or six islands that my dad was on. So it was, it was really something that fit everything together. <clears throat> so you'll see up there on one of the days, it's Benica up by uh, um, New Georgia, Guadalcanal, Tulagi. So we were hitting every, you know, almost every place he had been in the Solomons. And it also reminds me too of that with, with the cover page we had, um, South Pacific by James Michener, who was a very well-known author, both Hawaii and many others, I think a few others. But interestingly enough, he was in the South Pacific about the same time as a Lieutenant Commander uh, in the Navy. And he wrote about a lot of the things he did and on a lot of the islands that were there that we'll be going to too. So it was really nice how everything just started to fit together. <clears throat> That's just a quick um, uh, map of where we came from. The far right is California, Hawaii is toward the middle upper. And then we ended up uh, going to Fiji, Nadi Fiji, and then to the Solomons because that's the only way you could get there. On the way in LAX, I don't usually wear a cowboy hat, but I guess I did for that day, didn't I? Um, we met Vito Simone. He's from originally from Chicago. He lives out in LA. He was uh, um, a greeter there. And his hat says USS Wasp, which was an aircraft carrier that was sunk in the Solomons. But he actually was on it. And he was a, a back gunner for one of the dive bombers. And I guess it was lucky for him because unlucky, but lucky, he was, uh, had a bullet that hit his jaw. So he was out and was in the hospital. And that was the time that the carrier was sunk. So it was just kind of really um, awesome how we just met somebody that's where, where we're going to. So there's Janet with the Fiji Airlines behind her, kind of sleepy. <laughs> but that's the island of Guadalcanal, and it's the largest in the Solomons. And it, if you look, uh, because of the, the, the density of the island, especially the growth, most of the villages are on the shorelines or up by the coral uh, northern parts, but it's heavily, heavily, heavily forested island. And where we're going is Aniera, which is up toward the upper left there. This is a World War II picture of it. I think it's a great aerial picture that shows a lot about where we're gonna go. So we've got Guadalcanal, we're gonna go to Tulagi, we're gonna go up here in the Florida Islands, we're gonna go by Sabo, we're going to go um, sail through this area here with all the different straits up to New Georgia, and then we're gonna come back to Russell and then Guadalcanal. So that's where we're going right now. And that's basically a little route map of it, how, how it went. So once we hit the ground, we were transferred over to a, the Bill of Kiki, which is the ship behind us. And we, our whole events or our, all of our transportation was either the Bill of Kiki or these little tinny boats that they call them. And the Bilakiki is a dive boat typically, but this was not a dive excursion, it was historical. And uh, that's what it looked like from the rear upper deck. That was our dining room. And this was the first night sunset in the South Pacific. And um, you're gonna see a lot more and you're gonna get, uh, they become addictive because they're so unique and so beautiful. Uh, so the next, the first day we went to Tulagi, 
the invasion beach where the Marines were, Tanambogo, which was a Japanese uh, uh, garrison island, and then Kavutu, which is a seaplane island. The Japanese had seaplanes there. So this gives you an idea um, uh, what it was like. We, the boats far in the background and the, the tinnies would bring us to the shoreline. Um, we were on shore with our, we actually had a historian aboard with us, Andy Giles, and he was uh, uh, giving us all the history as we walked along. But this is where we started on that beach. Um, we walked along and saw a lot of the local uh, buildings and um, you can really appreciate the construction, especially when you look at it 80 years ago, right? Really nothing's changed in their construction methods, which is pretty amazing. Um, that was walking down one of the roads, again, more of their construction. Here's, uh, it's probably done by now, uh, oceanfront mansion that's available if you're interested in buying it. Uh, but it's made out of uh, uh, palm leaves and uh, some of the, the, the mahogany's or the rosewoods that are there. Um, and, and this was something we found quite a bit was on the side dumped into the ocean where that's a tractor. And those were all the things that were left over from when they left, uh, when World War, World War II ended and the Navy and the Marine Corps left. Um, I'll play this for you because it was Sunday. We happened to walk by a church and there was really pleasant sounds of singing coming from it. So I'll share that with you. So it was unique and it was, uh, again, very pleasant to just to hear the voices sing. Question, there's a like a cylinder on the right there hanging. Can anybody tell me what that was used for? Anybody? That's their church bell. <laughs> so that was a, 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 like a, 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 gas, a tank for gases and they hung it for the church bell. Um, many of the buildings are still in use. That's the Tulagi Hospital that was built by the, the Navy. The roads are still fairly intact considering probably nobody, nobody's done anything to it for 80 years. And this was the landing beach where the, uh, it was the second, second battalion of the Marine Raiders hit. By there, there were caves. And the Japanese were very proficient in cave building with networks of caves. And this was one of them where they placed a machine gun so that it would be uh, more or less hidden, but then they could certainly try to ward off the invasion. The British uh, were really the um, controlling force there in the 1800s and 1900s. Uh, and that was a colonial, British colonial cemetery. Uh, and then this, this is like their landmarks, how they designate their landmarks. And this was called Tulagi Pass or uh, the Cut Place. And during the 20s, it was an island where the English used it for, um, as a prison uh, for prisoners. And, um, there's one spot of the island that was separated by a, a ridge that was difficult to get to because you either had to go up the high ridge or walk around it. So they had the prisoners who had probably plenty of time on their hands uh, cut that um, narrow chasm so that they could easily go from one side of the island to the other. That's the logging. Yeah. What's amazing too is that was a naval shipyard. So still on Tulagi are, is a naval sh a shipyard. And even the old dry docks that were 80 years old plus are still being used to repair ships. And this was, um, it's overgrown now, but this was like at a point where the ships that would, Tulagi would be used for um, repaired ships. I mentioned that. So when a repair, a, a ship came into the harbor, they would see this first. And originally it had a sign there from Admiral Halsey. And you can see the ship on the bottom there. If you look closely toward the right, the front's damaged. So it's coming in for repairs. And that was Ad Admiral Halsey advice back then, which was, uh, you know, it, it was very to the point back then, but that sign it's no longer there, but that's where it was. Um, an interesting point in the photographs from my dad's uh, books, 
it's hard to see, but there's an outline. If you see it where the chains are connected, it's actually a, a Japanese submarine that they uh, it sunk and they pulled it out of the water in Tulagi. It was a two-man sub. So this is then we we leave on we leave on the Tinnies, and we went over to uh, Kanembogo, which was a uh, Another island that the, Jap the Japanese had for uh, the sea seaplane base, and they were, it was a connected by a causeway. But if uh, what we'll walk up to is a, a cave system, another cave system that they built, and then when you walk along the escarpment where they would have landed on the beach, again there's cave holes for for protection of the, the Japanese forces with mach by machine guns there. So Jan and I are up on the top of, of uh, Danambogo and um, there's the causeway you can see that connects it so they actually could walk back and forth. But uh, where we were at was a gun emplacement and that's what's left of it, but the concrete uh, foundation was there. And you could see it was in a perfect uh, observation spot from the slide before. And a uh, quick trip over to Kavutu. That's what remains of the seaplane ramp where the seaplanes would come up out of the ocean and then to get repairs or do whatever that needed to be done on them. And uh, the, uh, there's a building there, which is uh, concrete. So we figured it was from, for the munitions that were stored there, but there's really not any more, any built buildings there any longer. This was a gun emplacement for anti-aircraft. And there's even seaplane parts that wash up. So this, there's about two or three seaplanes that are about 60 feet below the surface where the where that ramp was. And some divers will often go down there, but this was still pieces of that aircraft that had washed ashore. That's a great picture. I think his name was John. And uh, you know, you, you can you, you, you're, you can be very happy when you're in the South, Solomon Islands. Port of Rita's Lemonades. So um, we went over to another area where they had actually ships that were, were uh, uh, yeah, apologize for that. Um, ships that were uh, basically stored after the war. This is an LST landing ship tank. It's a US ship. And then there was a, a uh, let me get rid of that thing on top here. I don't know why it's still up there. The Kikusuku was a destroyer that is also there. That's the original ship, uh, the LST, when it left the New, New York, Newark, New Jersey shipyard. It was um, torpedoed on July 18th of 1943. And uh, the back half of it blew off, but the front half was, was, was still uh, able to, to uh, float. So they, they towed it, despite the fact that there was 90 soldiers and sa sailors that were killed to this bay. That's what the, the ship looks like. So it's 330 feet long and it's about 50 feet tall. And those are big doors that open up to unload. That's what it looks like with a tank coming out of it. So when we saw it, it was like that. You can see by the scale of the boat, how big the, the bow is. And uh, the, it's a perfect ramp for sea crocodiles, because the sea crocodiles will go up there and sun themselves. So we took a couple run around, runs around it to just see the scope. And considering it's like 80 years old, it's still amazingly in good shape. You can see too that there's the doors are open. And we were told that at one time it served as a post office when they were there. <laughs> so um, that's the starboard side and you can uh, to this day the number is still in paint it's good paint back then probably lead <laughs> uh, but it's still on on the on the port side and then you can see the door open there and here's another one of those Solomon Island skyscapes that they just get better and better so I thought I'd make sure that you saw that uh, so the Kikusuki is a uh, destroyer. It, it was sunk basically in August when the Americans did the invasion. 
Um, the Navy wanted it because they thought there'd be some like uh, special intelligence that they could get in it. So they actually um, repaired it and then refloated it. So they refloated it. They were looking for long lance torpedoes, which the Japanese had much greater technology in, than we did in torpedoes. So after they were done using it, they towed it over to this, this bay. And that's what it looked like in 45. And that's today what it looks like overhead. So um, quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit different. What happens with these ships are uh, salvage companies in, come in and they cut all the steel off of it. So it's basically cut down to the, to the water line. So that's what's happened to it from looking like that to what it is today. And that's at low tide. We saw it, it was probably mid tide. So that's the, the bow of the ship. You're looking back a slight angle to where the rest of the ship is. You can kind of see the rest of the hull in the back. Um, what sticks out of the water is, is where the guns used to be mounted. And that's, that's about all that's left. But when we finish this trip, um, part of uh, all these islands are owned by tribes or owned by individuals. So every time we go somewhere, there'd be somebody there to collect the payment to visit. So th these two guys were there to collect the payment and um, they still make dugout canoes. I mean, it's rare to see a fiberglass or a metal canoe. They, they're master craftsmen, craftspeople with, their, with wood and the walls of that canoe are about a half inch thick, three quarter inch thick. So it's just amazing their craftsmanship. Stable Island was the next stop. And uh, as I mentioned, John had done a, uh, a speak about it and Sabo had no military action on it, but it was the site of the worst U.S. naval uh, disaster uh, in 1942. So the blue ships are the U.S. ships, the red ships are Japanese ships, and that's by Iron Bottom Sound. So that's where Galato Canal is, or Tulagi's up to the upper right. Sabo is there. And it was all in that area that it's called Iron Bottom Sound because of how many ships lie at the bottom of it. <clears throat> um, where we were at before was, does this thing show? Yeah, here's the LST. So we were over here and then the Kikusuki was over here. And now we're at Sabo Island. And I know John will permit me to say it, but his uncle was on the USS Quincy during that battle and went down with it. Yeah, Quincy is the one just above Sable Island. Right, yeah, can you, see, can you see the red dot? Yeah. It's right there, okay. But we went there on a peace mission and uh, we were told by uh, Valor that the kids enjoy having um, toys or school stuff. So pencils or paper, or racers, stuff like that. And I had come back from a convention. So I had all these toys and trinkets and trash what they call and uh so i was really popular until all all of the toys ran out <laughs> and you can see still to this day some of the traditional uh costumes are still worn with the dresses on those girls and an interesting story with my dad here's another picture he's in guadalcanal in 44 and he writes my mother a letter that says oh uh, my friend cap and i and it was cap tina he called him cap we went to uh we got a boat and we went out in the boat and then he talked about something else. Well, the story that he told me was that they went out in a boat and, and you can see there's like gas cans at the bottom. So they're, they're prepared to make it a haul, right? There's 10 gallons of gas. They're probably going to go to Tulagi or someplace. And he said that in the middle of the channel, the engine stopped and wouldn't restart. And they started to, to drift out into the, out of the bay into the ocean. So fortunately there was a naval ship that came and, and towed him back in, but uh, that's his extent of being in the Navy for a day. So there's another one of those skyscapes. They really are addictive. And uh, we're heading up toward the New Georgia Islands um, at Segi Airfield. It was a small fighter base. Um, the end of the airfield, uh, oh, let me just uh, go back here. By the, the end of the airfield, uh, 
literally is at the ocean. And you'll see it in a minute. And there's a P3. Bit. But that gives you an idea of our journey, um, where we're at now. We're definitely up toward the New Georgia Islands. And that's the official airport sign. And behind uh, the sign is the official Solomon Islands ticket terminal, which there wasn't anybody there. And then this was the official terminal building. And then, uh, and, and you can see some of the buildings are still of the U, of the World War II um, vintage because they just added that that porch on there. But most of the buildings are of World War II vintage. There was facilities there, so it was lucky because we were a long time on the boat. And uh, that's a uh, aerial shot of the air, airstrip today. So at the very bottom, you can see how the airstrip goes right into the ocean. And uh, we're on the airstrip. It's still used today by a smaller aircraft, the uh, piston aircraft. And that was looking up you know, toward the top of the airfield you just saw. This is at the bottom. So that's where it ends. This is on, this is on uh, up toward uh, New Georgia. We're, we're past Guadalcanal. Hmm? Not Henderson Field. No, we'll get to that. We circle back to Henderson Field. Oh, yeah. So um, the story was there's three P38 lightnings coming in for an emergency landing. This is a short field. If they would have used the entire field, they would have been okay. But apparently one or two of the pilots hit the runway a little bit late and they ended up in the water. And when we snorkeled over, to, over the P38s looked exactly like that just sitting in the ocean like that. So we began a lot of sailing because there's a lot of sailing in the different narrows and the straits. So that was uh, Viru Harbor. And uh, through Viru Harbor, we get to Rendova. And, uh, and Rendova was Kennedy's spot where he was stationed. And uh, with that, this was, the, you know, they have the main island of Rend Rendova. And then there's the smaller islands where the, the boats were actually based. And this is uh, one of those islands right, where Kennedy was, it's called Lumberia. And um, since all these islands are owned individually or by tribes, um, they maintain them. And this was the museum building in the background and they were building a new museum building. And in our foreground is um, what was a gun emplacement where they, the brown round discs were 50 gallon drums where they had placed sand so that they could uh, have some protection for the anti-aircraft guns. But that was the base that Kennedy's PT-109 was based out of. And this is an example of the museums that you see. They're not like our museums where you see um, perfectly, perfectly restored examples of things. These are all pickups and uh, and you'll see a lot of Coke bottles after this, but Coke bottles, I think every soldier, sailor, Marine uh, must have had about a thousand Cokes because there's, there's just thousands of these things. Um, these were things that were probably cast away in the ocean, canteens, you can see the salt damage on them, they're aluminum. And then this was the, the chief of the island and he, that was his collection of, of, of basically guns. So there's machine guns and there was a cannon breach and a few other things in John F. Kennedy's picture behind it. And then he had a memorial with actually there's a bust of Kennedy up on top of that block and there's their master carvers. So it's really a well done uh, carved wood bust with the plaque honoring JFK and then the coconut, which was what helped rescue him, if you recall the story. So maybe we'll get to that. I will pick up on that in a little bit. Um, and that was the chief's house. <laughs> and his water system is a cistern. You can see the cistern system. So after that, we um, going up to another airfield and um, I'll get rid of this thing. Uh, 
our escorts were porpoises very often. And it's not always sunny. It's, there was a little bit of cloud and rain there that day. But there's another just beautiful skyscape of the majesty of the different clouds that are there that form by close to the equator. Um, these guys were at the bow of the ship and they just, I um, want to get rid of that. They were at the bow of the ship and just kept swimming along the, uh, with the Bilakiki. And Raibu and Mumda, we've, we've gone to a fairly large settlement now. So um, they had actual stores there. That was the, uh, it's hard to see maybe, but it says that was their shopping center <laughs> and uh, their general store. And that was the uh, Munda airfield. And uh, it was the longest airfield in the Southern Hemisphere during the time uh, of World War II. And you can see the higher hills around it. They bring in jets there today. They, it's not just small aircraft, but jet aircraft that fly in there as well. It's well kept, coral one way. Um, there's an over aerial picture of it, the long strip, bombers would be on it. The U.S. took it over from the Japanese, just like Henderson Field in Guadalcanal, because, um, and because of that, there's a lot of ordnance that's still around, which is shells and things like that that were used for in the battle. And while we were walking in town, there was this, we don't, you don't see any vehicles there. They walk or they canoe. So this was, it stuck out tremendously. And uh, it was a, an amphibious vehicle. And it turned out um, those guys are from the uh, Royal Australian Air Force and, and the Army. And that vehicle, they were there to explode unex, unexploded ordnance. And that's still a big deal in the, in, in, in the Solomons. It happens even in Guadalcanal still. <clears throat> so, um, so it was nice to meet them. And uh, by the time we got back to launch off on the tinnies, the, the locals had uh, assembled a little bizarre flea market for us. And they had all of their just beautiful uh, woodwork, uh, bowls and uh, inlays. We brought a couple here. Um, there's one of, there's a bowl on the table and there's a couple of these nuts that they had, uh, they carved, they were just master carvers. So we thought we'd share that. And this is how the little titties were brought about in the back. And I don't, can't believe that rope held them, but they, were, they, they stayed intact. Um, this was not so much World War II, but uh, maybe Terry, you could help with the screen. I'm not sure what it wants me to do. You know, if you touch the button, you might lose everything. <laughs> so that's, the next okay. that's okay, Scott. I was going to ask you to start your video because I noticed that we don't see you on Zoom. Very good. Here it goes. Sweet. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, this wasn't so much World War II, but it was really interesting. It's called Skull Island uh, on Re Re Roviana, which is near uh, Gizu. And as a sacred island, we were told, with native chief and warrior skulls. Um, no, sorry about that. We gotta go back in and out, so we're stuck. So um, it, that, was the, that was the real light story of it. Um, it says no trespassing. Again, you're not supposed to be there. Did a little more reading about it and uh, it's a sacred island from the days of when they had headhunters in the Solomons and how they handled things in the Solomons back then was if you had a dispute, you just killed the other person and then you took their head. So believe it or not, this island was part of a shrine for those activities and Gizu, the Gizu tribe was one of the most prolific at, uh, at, at, at doing this. So um, there was some traditional burials there, but then um, there were mounds of coral mounds of the skulls and uh, 
as you can see, they were pretty much everywhere. So uh, there's another, um, a close up of some, another one. And um, I learned later that you were supposed to go there with a chief because the chief would allow you uh, to, the, the, to enter there without the spirits uh, being, being a problem for you. So um, I'm not sure if he was a chief, but I hope he was. And, uh, and I think he was because we haven't had any trouble with it. Uh, and then we continued up through the, uh, going through the uh, New Georgia, through different islands, different passes, um, not very well or heavily inhabited, but you would see houses like this along the way. This was the main way that they do commerce. They have motor boats where their goods are transported. And we came up then, now we remember the, we had been on, uh, on uh, Lombari Island. So now we're in the area where the Coast Watchers were and the Coast Watchers were hired by the English before the war to actually see what's going on, what movements are going on, they'd have radios. So this was the area of the Coast Watchers and uh, we're going to Olasana and, and, and Plum Pudding Island, which is now called Kennedy, but both of those islands Kennedy was, was uh, on. That's Olasana on the left side. It has, it's an uninhabited island. There's really nothing there. Uh, but the other island was much more um, modern. That was the boat landing. And uh, it was, it's Kennedy Island. So that was the, that's where they swam to originally when they were shipwrecked. And that's, you know, the story goes, Kennedy had a life preserver uh, strap that he was swimming with, to bring one of the guys there. And uh, it's actually a beautiful bar and restaurant there. And they have a, a, a storyboard to dedicate the whole story back in four, August of 43, when that happened. And they have a, a, another dedication with relics. Relics are everywhere in that uh, area. Uh, the only Kennedy on the island was this one. Come, sir, Kennedy, come here, Kennedy, come. Oh, pretty vocal, huh? Come, 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 come. No, I have a hard time doing that. Come, come, come. Hey, come here, come down. Come down, come down. That's enough of Kennedy. This was in front of the bar. There's a propeller there. It looks like it was from one of maybe what aircraft, aircraft. It hit the water because it's bent. Interesting, more interesting is that there's a little cannon there. And when I, when I had uh, went to the rear of the cannon, um, maybe it's hard to see, but in the center, like right there, it's a little gold, goldy color, brass color. Well, that, there's still a artillery shell in the cannon. <laughs> so that was, uh, surprising to see that and we made a quick exit <laughs> those were the owners of the island and uh, but it was they were very 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 welcoming and uh, there was nothing happened with the with the cannon uh, and then we're starting to get to the end of the journey uh, north we went to Gizu and uh, that was another place where there's um, a tremendous amount of fighting that went on in New Georgia my dad was on one of the or islands in New Georgia. He said they worked on airstrips. So it could have been Sege, it could have been Munda, but I, I'm not clear on that. And at Gizu, that was like our main terminus. So you've got little villas here that you can rent out right on the ocean, which are really, really a beautiful scenic place to be away from the world for a while, if you'd like. I like this video because it just shows how the nice escort to slow motion, but you can see them coming out of the water. They were just following us most of the time. The porpoises. <clears throat> and when rough water was going to happen, we, we'd know it in advance because they bungee cord the coffee makers. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, and then another island, which wasn't so much World War II significance, but it was cultural significance was Karamulan. Um, we were met by the, I think the entire tribe. Uh, there's the chief, and I, you're gonna have to watch the chief because he's kind of like a quick change artist here. He, he's pretty eventful in what, all the things that he does. So we met by the chief and the wonderful young ladies with fresh flower laced. Uh, we all had one, there's the chief on the right. They sat us down and uh, you can maybe see it, but we gave it, they gave us coconut drinks. There's the coconut drinks, there's one there too. And uh, what we were getting to see soon was, well, I wanted to show this too. This was some 1944 pictures of the Solomon Islander um, folks. And uh, so those were some of the picture collections that were in uh, our, the, the, the albums. And today's version is much more colorful and they also have grass skirts, but. <laughs> Musical instruments are PVC pipe. You see that? <laughs> and uh, there's white PVC pipe, which is rainwater. No, I don't know what it's for. And there's black, which had a slightly different diameter. And there's a guy, fellow sitting down right there. And if you can see it, there's a drum here, and he has like a log, and he hit, he slams it into the back of the of the uh, uh, barrel to make the bass sound, which was just, just amazingly clever, I thought. So let me just finish it off here. There's the chief, no red shirt. amazing but the men had to have their dance too so here's the chief on the left and he's he's got a little bit different attire on but uh They tap each other's uh, um, heels. I think it's a, it signifies like the war type dance. another really spectacular thing to see there in the Solomons. You just don't see that every day. Um, these two young ladies wanted to adopt Janet and they really wanted her wedding ring. <laughs> so, uh, but they were still very, 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 very kind people. And uh, that's their school, which is mostly run by missionaries. There's um, the alphabet and there's days of the week and there's some of their artwork that's displayed there. Um, and this is another 40, 43, 44 picture of, uh, uh, of some of the construction. And you can see that's almost an identical building uh, behind all of the, the foreground. But uh, I chose this picture because there's a lot of cuts on that 
uh, coconut palm. There's a cuts, looks like cuts there. And I asked what that was. And uh, um, one of the, the men would take a knife or a machete and cut a bee cut about this long and then eat it. And it was considered an aphrodisiac. So that must be a pretty lucky tree, I'd say. And this is a little more of the construction. This one has a little bit more wood to it. And they had a fine display of conch shells. And I love this picture because it has the, the traditional building. I think that was considered an out, like a kitchen out there, the separate building. And then they have their, next to their, their garage, so to speak, they have their, their main form of transportation, the dugout. Whose house is this? Anybody guess? The Chiefs, you got it. Yeah, you got it. You got it. A little different. Um, so now we're uh, heading back now to um, the Russell Islands. I can't see where my. We're going back this way here. And that's the Russell Islands. So on, on the boat, the food was magnificent. There's I have fresh vegetables and fresh. Uh, fruits and meats and fish. And I'll show you where they get it in a, in a, in a couple more um, slides, but uh, we came upon the Russell Islands, which there was a lot of information from my dad about Benica and that there's a, there's a port, if you can see it between the, um, uh, the one boat on the, toward the middle and then there's an, another boat toward the far right where the, uh, where the edge of the uh, edge of the screen is, there's a port there, and they built that port um, back in uh, 40, 44. There's no vehicles except the police vehicles, and we had to drive to the airstrip. So the Billikiki members were fortunate enough to get the police department to escort us around there. So that was our our, our police escort, and uh, that that I think was the chief of police, not a regular chief. There was school children there. It's not a highly inhabited island. It's a coconut plantation. The island almost from north, south, east to west is coconuts. So coconuts are everywhere. So we drove to the airfield and on the airfield, it's pretty overgrown. They haven't used that airstrip for years, um, but that's copra and that's the inside of a coconut. So that's where the oil comes from and you know the coconut flakes, the edible part, and they usually dry it. So somebody was drying all the coconut copra out there, copra. Benica in the Russells. And next to it was Pavuvu where the first Marine Division had uh, bivouac there after, after uh, some of their uh, engagements with the enemy. And Benica was a nice island. Pabubu was not a nice island. It was loaded with crabs, <laughs> big crabs. Uh, so this is the end of the airstrip. And this one had a particular significance because uh, I read one letter where um, he didn't write a lot about what he did because he knew that it would cause a problem with my mom. You know, you can't do anything, right? So, um, he writes this letter and he's like, I can't believe it. I'm gonna tell you about this. I met some pilots and we, um, they're letting us go up in the airplanes uh, and we're flying around at 10,000 feet. And oh boy, when we landed, we really came down fast to hit a, th a thousand feet and my stomach didn't feel so good. And I'm in the front dome of the bomber and I can see everything. I can see down Japanese planes and I can see coral. And he's like rambling on and on and on, and on about this. So, um, you know, there's a lag in between the letters, right? So like one letter he wrote, another letter he wrote, about the third letter or so, um, he's like, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. I promise, I'll never do it again. I won't, I won't, I won't, I promise. So, um, but knowing my dad, he just didn't tell it. <laughs> so that was the airstrip and it was fun because I scribed his name in the coral there. And uh, at the end of this runway, they had a, it was called Wimpy's Cafe. I found the picture in the album and it was a, uh, 
there was a lot of cattle on the island. And sometimes they get hit by vehicles or aircraft. And that was used to help stock Wimpy's Cafe. <laughs> This is some of the foundations and the buildings of the uh, of, of what they they some of the things they built there. They built a a rest camp, and they built that pier. So these are some foundations and some of the original buildings left over. Um, it's it was a panorama. So uh, the other story he had about Danica, which was pretty eventful, was when he got there. There were so many coconuts, and they ate coconuts and ate coconuts and ate coconuts. Mm -hmm. And he got really sick. So that was the hospital he was in right there. And, uh, and to the day, the last day they lived, he never had another coconut. <laughs> he never did. I, I just never forget that. That's, that was him there on the island. Benica has a lot of the original structures and uh, it's, it was good to see that. This was a Quonset huts, which most of us are familiar with. It was very standard World War II uh, construction, but it was stripped off. And then typically the, the, the locals would use the, the metal for their own purposes. So that's why you see it the way it is. Oops, I flipped it too fast. Figured this is the power plant. There's uh, steam uh, boilers. This is the power plant that uh, basically electrified the whole base and that building still stands. And no matter where you go, there's somebody with a can of spray paint <laughs> to make sure that uh, you can enjoy the local art. But that was part of the power plant too. And um, that pole there was actually uh, steel I-beams that the engineers used for the elect electrical poles. So they used metal poles for electricity, which was interesting. Huh? And to the right there is an intact quant, so you can just see a little part of it. And I think there, there was probably like a, a, a guard shed there to the left. There's still vehicles there. There's a, that's a, a bulldozer, it's a truck. This was, looks like a greenhouse, except it was a green hut because it was a Quonset hut. And uh, same thing happened where they, they stripped the, um, the metal to use it for their own roofs. Um, again, this is a very, I got a lot of information about this little island. They had a USO show there that he attended, and that was their amphitheater. They just cut logs, and that's where you sat. And Bob Hope was there. And these are actually his pictures. Joey Colonna, who was a real character, right? And uh, Faye Ray. So he had a pretty good seat. I wonder how he got that. <laughs> but uh, that was from the actual show he saw. And then uh, we headed out from Benica and the kids were always interested in what was going on. Uh, in fact, one of them actually tried to race us, but he didn't do, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they, didn't, they, they couldn't cut it against the Bellakiki. <clears throat> and still on Benica was um, PT boat bases. And I remember he told me, he said, um, one of the islands I was on had PT boat bases and uh, the B Black Sheep Squadron, if you remember those, uh, Pappy Boyington and the Marine Corps, they were there as well. So while he was there, that was all going. This, this, um, oops, I'm hitting the wrong button, I'm sorry. Right here is where it was a steel pier that came out and was, uh, 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 had some pylons that attached to them. That's where the PT boats would, uh, would be docked. And we, we snorkeled around there and uh, that's where that, this Coca-Cola bottle came from. Uh, sorry, Zoom crowd, but uh, um, it's an co old Coca-Cola bottle from World War II that has uh, coral on it. And uh, the Andy Giles found it and gave it to me. And uh, that was, uh, there was a lot of things down there. They had dumped a lot of things down there, like munitions. Somebody brought back some, some cartridges because they were just down there. That was typical after the war, just dumped it. Well, while we were there, all of a sudden we'd see one canoe, two canoes, three canoes, four canoes. And uh, the next thing you know is you have like 
10 canoes. So that was our um, farmer's market. That's where they stocked the ship for um, fruits and vegetables. If they had fish, they'd buy fish from them. And if you notice, those canoes are all handmade dugouts with uh, tremendous precision. I mean, if you look at the walls, like it's maybe a half inch thick. And uh, so um, one of the, the uh, crew members was uh, purchasing the, the uh, food from them. And this is really a cool, I think that's a beautiful picture, the dugout canoe with the boys. One's painted, one still uh, needs paint, but uh, that's just how they get around. Uh, from Manica, they went to Guadalcanal, and that's actually uh, one of the ships that they were on, 196. So it's a smaller ship, and uh, it, it only took them a couple hours to get there. And that's where we're back at Guadalcanal. And there's the Solomon Island Navy, <laughs> their one boat, because most of this, they're protected by Australia. And uh, this is a World War II map of where we're at now. Um, and this shows where their, their outfit landed in uh, 19, 1944. So it was to the east of Aniera. And, but it does show all the different airfields. So um, Henderson Fields up here, there was a fighter strip here. There was another fighter strip, uh, let's see. This is a bomber strip and there's another fighter strip over here. But um, that's where they landed. And then this is now going west from the previous map. So we have uh, Henderson Fields over here. And uh, these are all of the different monuments that we'll visit in a minute. There's uh, the American Monument here, and there's um, the Japanese Peace Memorial. Where, where's my, where's my, there we go. I think that's there. And we're going to Bloody Ridge, which was a battle site. They're up here. And uh, so we're gonna go there to visit those. And that's the site uh, from, one of the memorials, it's just a beautiful site that they could, you could see just about everything in the city. The American Memorial is uh, really beautifully done. It shows all the battles on those obelisks and uh, talks about all the different uh, activities that went there and units that were there. You can see it's high on a hill and it turns out that that star in the middle, when they were building this, they found the remains of a soldier that was actually a battle site. And uh, I can actually do this, I think. It shows uh, during the ex ex excavation, they found him and eventually they were able to identify him. So he actually was in the uh, third battalion of the fifth Marines and was killed on Hill 73, which is what they it was called then in August 19th. So that was early, early in the battle. Oops. So that was an amazing find and then they could do that dedication for that person. Another, another memorial is the Boozum and Coast Watcher Memorial, which the, Sol uh, the Solomon Islanders are really proud of the Coast Watchers. Booza was a Coast Watcher originally with uh, one of the English um, like governors there and uh, at 55 years old, 1942, he helped the Marines Division uh, with, with the Achiki Battalion. Uh, he was captured, they bayoneted him, it was pretty gruesome. He, he was able to make it back to the lines and he gave the, uh, the US Marines the intel what intelligence he knew about it. And later on, they were in battle with the Achiki Battalion and they actually overwhelmed them, the US did. So he's, very prominent. He was uh, knighted by the queen. Um, he was given various awards. And uh, so he, he's one of their heroes. Um, here's a little stand on the way. We, uh, we had uh, beetle nuts there. And beetle nuts are something that they love. They chew them and it makes them feel really good. 
<laughs> and the only downside about beetle nuts are they have like a red compound in them. So if you chew them, your teeth turn yellow or turn red. And it, it creates like a certain saliva action. So if you look on the ground, oh, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, if you look on the ground, there's little red spots. So that's, they spit, they spit it out. And uh, that's part of the culture, more or less. So um, you have to watch where you stop in some of the places. But it's very, that's what they do. They love beetle nuts. So we went to the Bilu War Museum. And most of these museums were, in their heyday, were probably 20 years ago, because that's when the vets were still visiting. But you're starting to see that there's time is, age is taking a toll on it. Um, that's actually a aircraft, a Navy aircraft uh, air, airplane that looked like that. That's a wing of a B-17 with the early markings that had the red dot for the US star. And they got away from that because the red dot looked like the Japanese planes. And sometimes they'd get shot down because of that. That's the front end of a Japanese Betty bomber, which looked like that. This is, this is really a mess. It's a P-38 Lightning that I think was on fire, but uh, it still had the engines in it. The guns were still in it. And that's really what it looked like when it was intact. It's a very beautiful aircraft. Janet's by a Corsair, which was a gull wing, they call that. It had that unique um, dip in its wing. And that's like uh, Boyington and the Black Sheep Squadron flew. This is the cannon that doesn't have a shell in it. Because <laughs> you can see out the end of it. You can see the, the light at the end of the tunnel there. And that was a Japanese cannon that they captured. And uh, that too was the owner of, of the museum itself. So we went over to um, Kamimbo Bay where the Tokyo Express would run every night with destroyers and, and sometimes transports. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, that's where you'll see a freighter or a transport that was sunk there. But they have everywhere that there was a battle field the Japanese put a monument to. And that's, that's part of the bay itself. It's a beautiful, peaceful bay. And uh, the boat itself still lies in the shallows. That's another aerial of it, the transporter trip. And I pulled out of the picture file from my dad. Um, he had taken a picture of it when it was originally there before it was salvaged and all that. So that's what it looked like originally when it was, when it was uh, intentionally put on shore. And then uh, all that remains are some, some of the uh, internal works uh, of the ship itself. And that's, that's about it. That's all that's left from the salvaging. Um, this is a tank, a US tank. And we actually went probably where there was a gunnery range because we, they, they showed us this um, same tank and there was a dedication to the 14th Infantry there on the back of it. But everything else had been stripped off of it. And it actually looks pretty good. Maybe we should ship it back and restore it. But then you have to look at all sides like a car, right? And that side didn't look so good. It was part of a gunnery range. And then we're getting toward the, toward the last days and we're in Aniera, we're driving around at bust. We went to the invasion beach. We went to Alligator Creek where that cheeky um, battalion I just spoke about uh, was uh, at a battle. Henderson Field, Ed Edson's Ridge, Bloody Ridge, Peace Park, Mount Austin, and there's a museum there. So that was all in one day. So it was, we saw a lot. Uh, picture this beach now with all the US um, invasion craft in the horizon and all the boats coming to, to do the invasion of the first Marines. There's really not much of a memorial talks about the day and the, the uh, regiments that were there. A few relics that are left, but it's really used as a camping spot now because uh, you can see kind of like the camping equipment behind in the, in the background there. 
the Cheeky Battalion actually was uh, trying to attack and re retake Henderson Field. Henderson Field, let me back up, Henderson Field was important because the Japanese put that field there so that they could reach Australia and cut off the landline to the US. So that's why the, all the initial uh, fighting was here. So when we invaded it, uh, the Japanese wanted to retake it because we really had a very narrow uh, strip that we had taken control of. So they were gonna come around, but they had to cross that creek and it's called Tanura River, but it was mismarked on the marine maps. It's really the Alligator Creek. So this is what the creek looks like today. The right side is where the US was and the left side, it's more or less floodplain. And that's what it looks like from where the US positions were. So the, uh, the uh, battalion, the Japanese battalion came racing over to attack and this whole wall was uh, with Marines and they were able to basically totally wipe out that uh, battalion, the Cheeky Battalion with that and some other actions. <clears throat> Memorial to their fallen dead. Some locals that were trying, let's see, he had found a little cartridge case somewhere and he wanted my Fitbit watch as a trade. So it, but I can't, I, I give him credit for trying. Um, that's my dad. I almost, I, I swear that's at the same point that where we were. And then they, here's a plaque when we went over to Henderson Field. So, um, and that was dedicated to Henderson. He was a, a flight commander during, I think, the Battle of uh, Midway, which was the turning point. So there was a dedication plaque for that. And that's what Henderson Field looked like way back then. With the same type of planes that we saw at the museum. This was a picture of the, the two um, control towers. First one to the left, the second one to the right. I think uh, one of our, the, the regimental units in the battalion actually built that second one. Um, but today, the original still stands. It's not something you want to go up on, but it does still stand. And um, there's like a brown uh, patch in, in, the, in the foreground. And it looked as though that was like a, a, um, a bomb shelter. So when they were under uh, attack, they could run to the bomb shelter. That's him. He's a corporal there in the Solomons. Uh, another little roadside stand. Um, the family there trying to sell their goods and some of them are a little more clothed than the others, but it was, they're always in cheerful and in bright clothes. And a U.S. memorial to the uh, Etzen Ridge, Bloody Ridge battle where that basically stopped the Japanese from overtaking Henderson Field. That were on top of the ridge, the houses weren't there, so the Japanese came up from below and attacked and tried to come up the ridge where the Marines were. And this is like a picture of the ridge. And in the background, I don't know if you ever heard of Vassalone, he was a Medal of Honor winner, but that's where he won his Medal of Honor, was there. That's another picture of what they were defending and how the Japanese had to come up uh, over the hill. Oh, and I wanted to show you this too, although I might end up having, there's still barbed wire there, can you see it? There's still barbed wire from there, from the action back in uh, 42. Oh. It doesn't like when I do that. Again, Japanese are very reverent over their dead. Another um, uh, commemoration. And from here, we went to another museum. It was called, uh, it was on the Church of the Latter-day Saints property, but it was called the Bedekama School Museum. So that's Japanese uh, art artillery. Those are engines from aircrafts. This was an interesting plane. It's a P-39. And if you can tell the engine is here and the pilot was here. So it was one of the few aircraft that actually had the engine, not in the front, but in the back. And, and it looked like this when it was flight in flight. Real beautiful aircraft. 
And that's got those original early markings that we talked about. Another um, thing for uh, part of the museum was this, it's called a Bren carrier, but it was made by Ford. And if a Jeep won't go somewhere, this was supposed to be the thing to take you there. That's what it looked like from more or less the top. And there was another aircraft there that really sustained tremendous damage. It was hard to tell what it was, but the flaps, the perforated flaps there, tell what it was, it was a dive bomber. So, and then another thing on property was this tractor, which I wouldn't doubt the engineers used to haul heavy equipment around. And then there's pieces of uh, aircraft, nose art, ordinance, uh, more guns, helmets, machine guns, artillery, and an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> and we went there to, uh, to the actual peace memorial that the Japanese have, and there's uh, uh, buildings and a shrine in there, which uh, I guess the, they would go there to when they visited uh, their loved ones. We couldn't help take a picture of this. Um, what was that, Janet? Do you remember? Some of the local flowers. Yeah, it was. I thought it would be like fruit, but they said it actually is poisonous, so you wouldn't want to have it. But it looked very interesting. And now we're on top of Mount Austin, which was one of the last battlefields. The U.S. Army was the one that took this one. It wasn't the Marines, the Army did it. And one of them was, uh, I think with 132nd was had a lot of Illinois people in it. But that was very, very heavily protected. Um, it was the great observation point. They could see everything going on at Henderson Field, so they didn't want to give that up. You can see, uh, you know, the vantage that you have up there. Um, and up there, uh, there's a village and I can't help but love this picture because there's definitely a family dispute going on here. And the boy is looking at his sister and his sister's definitely giving a story to the mom. And the older sister's kind of like saying, really, you know, really? But she's got, the mom's got the machete, so everything's under control. <laughs> and then in the village, there was, uh, you know, we saw some of the families there. They had this museum called the Mount Austin Museum. So they spend much of their time picking up whatever's left over. So you'll see thousands and thousands of relics in here. And, uh, and I will go through some of them uh, and I'll try to help you recognize them. But, um, and they've been doing this for what, 80 years? So I can imagine there must've been 10 times about this that not only was here, but went out with the pe people that had visited in prior times. So there's a little diorama of, uh, those are round discs or Japanese dog tags. So that's how they'd identify their dead by the dog tags. And on the right side, it looks like test tubes. Those are morphine ampules that they use in their first aid kits. And uh, on the top are, are the, 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 the handle from hand grenades that they picked up. So they threw a lot of hand grenades. And here's another little diorama that has pickups of all of the, uh, uh, cartridges and there's also actually hand grenades up here, full ones. And you don't ask if they um, have any abilities, but uh, you just probably assume for the worst. These are guns that they were picked up. Those are rifles. There's artillery shells to the left there, the big round hole, uh, tubes, Japanese and US helmets. There are, uh, let's see, there's rifle parts. There's most of those uh, glass jar uh, bottles were from uh, uh, drugs. And then on the right, there's bayonets and swords that are really rusted. And then again, here's more of a collection. There's actually some Japanese hand grenades here, uh, right here. They look a little different, but it's more of the same. And it's, I can't imagine how much they picked up over the 80 years. And what else, of course, Coke bottles. Coke bottles everywhere. But one of the more, um, 
Oh, somber pickups that they get are the bags have bones in them. And they can tell from the positions um, usually what side they were on. So the Japanese uh, officials and representatives will come over and pick them up and then take them back to Japan. That was our crew that got us safely through World War II territories. And they were just tremendous. And we returned back to um, Aniera and we stopped at the museum, an art gallery and Janet, um, this is the artist that did that painting and we have that in our house because it's just so interesting. It's a, uh, if you look closely, I know the computer won't let me do it, but most of the design is fish uh, in, in those, um, in the lines. And uh, when we go back, there's actually a, a, a man figure standing there with like a, a elongated fish head and that was one of their fish gods. So that was a painting that uh, he had done and it was beautifully done. So uh, we enjoy having it. Here's your, they know they speak pigeon English, pigeon English there. So this is your pigeon English class. And uh, so some of it's pretty easy. Anybody want to take a stab at the first one? No spit and be nut. What was the last word? Anybody get the last word? All about. All about. So once you hear it, it's English, but they don't spell it that way. And then the other one is no pro rubbish all about. So you got a mini lesson in, in pidgin English. And then we did stop at the Solomon Island Museum. That's one of their war canoes during the headhunting times. That's actually a war canoe that was preserved and they have on, on premises. A little diagram for it and explained that um, the headhunting was something that was normal up until the English came and the missionaries came. One of their ceremonial huts. Um, and for those on Zoom, I, we included some uh, references or good resources. Uh, if you wanna look further into any of these things that we talked about today. And I think, thank you for your patience and your attention. Um, Scott? That's uh, Mitzi Gaynor and I forget who else that is. Our, Scott, before yeah. you answer the questions, could you repeat the questions for the people on Zoom? Okay. From the audience. Uh, sure. Uh, a certain person wanted to know um, if that was my father, mother, mother. The answer is uh, I don't have blonde hair, so that might answer the question. <laughs> uh, so yeah, any uh, any questions that you might have, I'd be happy so the to. Next two sessions are just different islands and similar this. Yeah. Week and the week after. The next two sessions are totally different islands. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm thankful that you're so patient because there's a lot of content on this because I didn't realize you could do a separate one on Solomon Islands and then one on the Guadalcanal. Uh -huh. But um, I think we were able to condense it, so hopefully. We were able to get um, what you needed out of it, but the other ones are going to be on uh, the Spiritu Santo, which is a, was a for, forward base during World War II, and uh, it has a tremendous amount of history there. Beautiful island, beautiful place to visit, and uh, you know, uh, it's they're all secrets. Nobody knows when we when we visited the Solomons, we tell people we went to the Solomons, and they'd say, "What's that?" Well, they don't know it. They don't even know it from history. So, um, and then the one before, one, the last one will be about um, New Caledonia, which is another interesting place. It's totally opposite of this. It's a French protectorate. And it's like being in, uh, in little Paris, Noumea is. So there'll be a lot of the military history plus the current history and uh, and then the sightseeing and the cultural things that we did.
did I answer any of the questions about the uh, John F. Kennedy or did you still have a question on that? Oh, I thought maybe you had a question before about when Kennedy was there. No, okay. Scott, there's some questions on Zoom. Um, someone wants to know if was there very much English spoken or was it mostly tribal language? Okay, that's a great question. They all sp spoke pidgin uh, for the most part. I think there's like 67 dialects of the, or their own language, but it's united through that the pidgin uh, uh, language. So uh, we could really pretty much uh, manage anywhere we went there because the, there was that ability to communicate. We kind of spell it as well as they can, but we certainly could, could understand what they were saying and they could understand us. It's, it's still that way, Bill. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you heard that, but um, there was uh, uh, Bill had been to Aniera five years ago, and all the paves. The town, roads in town were paved, but the minute you got out of Aniera, there are mud roads and they're still that way. There's still mud roads, right? Just, yep. Uh, someone on Zoom mentioned um, the name of that presenter was Jerry Colonna. I didn't get that. Uh, the, the USO uh, show, they said, was that Jerry Colonna? It's Jerry Colonna, did I say Joey Colonna? Did I see? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zoom listener out there. Jerry Colonna. Yeah, he was a character. Yeah. What, what did you like most about this part of the school? We, Just being where your father and Jerry yeah. Was what did I like? What did we like the most about the tour that we were on? I think just being on the boat was really a tremendous thing to the to Valor tours, uh, not having to really, we never stayed a night on land uh, while we were on the tour. And then just being on the high sea and seeing those skyscapes were just so dramatic. And, uh, uh, and then interacting with the people that uh, the, the, the uh, tribal dances that we saw were really spectacular. So that's why we showed them, shared them with you. And, uh, I'd say that was like the top three. When you say some of them were private islands, who they bought us from? Who owned the islands? Who owns the islands? Pardon? Yeah, that's a good question. Oh. One of the islands, that Benica Island, um, it's actually, I think it's owned by Lever Brothers. But who did they buy it from? From the tribal people? Something they would have from? bought it from, yeah, whoever was in possession of it to transfer okay, so the they weren't, Those islands weren't under control. Uh, Japan and the Philippines previously. Uh, right, they were part of the Solomon Islands. Uh, I know that. Yeah, right. Who controlled the Solomon Islands? Who controlled Islands. those? So um, I think some of the Russells at one point in time, I have to check this, but I think they were under the Netherlands because that whole area was Europe had split it all up. Yeah. Germans had some things, the Dutch had things, French to some extent, Spain. After World War II, it cleaned up a little bit because the Germans were not on the most favorable list. But uh, uh, Russell's, I believe, were still the English part. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking like in South America, some down, like Earth style, I think the Madness was under the control of Portugal. So that there were countries, and these islands you know, once they were sort of steeped, discovered, someone, yeah. you know, some other Somebody. European country. Right. And so that's why all these private people bought them. You heard today about movie stars. From uh, the, uh, the, the Russell Islands were within the Solomon Islands, which was under the British protector con oh. control. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The one next week was under French and British. The island was like divided, which was pretty, mm -hmm. pretty unusual. But yeah, that's a good question. And then why was it private? The Lever Brothers own it and it's a plantation. And so they have like workers there, staffs there. And then, uh, but there's very minimal that goes on there. 
and, and it showed by the building still being pretty much intact. Thanks. Got no more questions on Zoom. Are there any other questions in the audience before we sign off? It looks like we're clear. All right. Thank you so much for sharing this. You're fortunate to have such wonderful information left from your dad. Uh, well, thank, thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you.